So let's talk a little bit about you know this program that I mentioned about you know quote unquote sort of a new democratic settlement, a new settlement, a new reestablishment, regime change, whatever you want to call it, that this program that Fidesz led by Viktor Orban has has started and has endeavored trying to ch really change Hungary, put it into a different direction for the next decade. That's that's what it wants, it tries to do. That's what it attempts to do. Um, and. Uh, so let's look at some of these, these things. As, as I mentioned, I already mentioned some of them, some of these aspects, um, but uh, let's just you know, add a few uh, other things. Uh, free market, yes, but in the interest of the people. Uh, 2008 economic crisis, banks, in, most, in many countries, banks have been bailed out and the people suffered. In Hungary, they have turned this around, and just like in Iceland, again, other countries have tried this and have done it successfully, they went the other way. They have taxed the banks, not the people. And it has worked. But that's the, here's the interesting thing. Uh, the, this government by Fidesz has introduced some unorthodox, meaning not liberal, neoliberal, uh, IMF, whatever, World Bank prescribed uh, solutions, and I'm not taking sides here because I don't care, um, but it's interesting that, first of all, what Orban did is, they the country was hugely under debt, they paid back the debt, refused to take new loans, and went their own economic path, which was hugely criticized because it was unorthodox, uh, by which they taxed the banks, not the people. They passed laws by which these, uh, these loans that have been given out to the population, just like in Poland, in Swiss currency, which really hurt the people because when the you know, they got the loans in Swiss currency, but they had to pay it back in the local currency. Well, if your money gets devalued, right, then you have to pay more and more for the same amount that you have, you have uh, taken out as a loan. So actually, it's a tremendously disadvantage, disadvantageous loan for the people, because this works if it's, you know, uh, if, the, if the rate remains the same, it's, you, you basically just pay back what you've taken out with the whatever uh, additional sums. But here, because of the dev devaluing of the currency and problems of the economic crisis, they had to pay much more. So hundreds of thousands of people were in danger of losing their apartments and everything. Well, the government that came into power, Fidesz, a populist government, uh, decided, no, we will make sure that nobody will lose their apartment, nobody will lose their, their house. Instead, we will introduce several laws to uh, penalize the banks that uh, uh, increase rates uh, without a legal justification, that instead we will make sure that the, the, the loan paid back are rescheduled and so on, so at least the majority of those people will not lose their houses and so on, that will be a priority. So my point here, to giving this example, is that the core of the politics and of its econ economic policy, it is yes, free market, but the point is in the interest of the people. Free market in the interest of the population. The nation, quote unquote nation, right? We know the problems with that name, with that term, uh, is the goal of the economy, not vice versa. So you see, this is not traditional liberal. The traditional economic liberalism says, let the market do its thing, it's enough. the invisible hand will take care of things, right? Well, here they said it doesn't look like it. Okay? So let's put the market at service, uh, so put, put it within a certain framework that. Say they, they say it's in the uh, service of the population. Another, other things that they have done, they have re, renationalized some of the public utilities because Hungary, at a certain point, the population of Hungary pay, pay, paid the highest rates of utilities in Europe, which is weird because they didn't have the highest income in Europe, of course. Uh, so, uh, all the utilities have been privatized. They said, no, no, this is part of, again, the, the national wealth renationalizing and giving rates that are uh, doable and, and so on. So all kinds of things in which sound unorthodox, but again, it is not about statist economy because that's not the goal at all, uh, clearly, right? But it is a sort of a rethinking of the role of the economy uh, and of the role of the market and, and putting it within bounds in which the people have to win out of it and so on. So that is, that is, the, that is the, the direction. Thing is, huge criticisms, huge attacks and so on. The fact is, it has worked, and Hungary today has an economy that is growing, is actually growing, uh, and faster than most of the rest of Europe, or at least you know, the highest rates, it is growing, they have paid uh, back this, this international loans, so, you know, it seems to be working. So, remember Poland, right? Poland had a similar story, Poland had a similar story, and I would argue that the Polish uh, uh, situation was a model for, for Hungary, and the Slovak situation. 
was a, was a model for Hungary in taking their own path and saying, you know what, let's forget uh, liberal economic orthodoxy and go our own way. Of course, this can have dangers, but and it has to be economically feasible and it involves some, you know, they had to renationalize or uh, the, the pension system, which was privatized, uh, and that gave them lots of funds to do this, and you know, there are all kinds of other things. And, and uh, but the point is that. Uh, before this, Hungary, uh, Hungarian economy was sort of a, had no protections, okay? Because it's the idea of the liberal world economy, you know, the, the factors, the, the forces just go through, you know, you just are an object to these forces. And this is a sort of more nationalist or national oriented view of the economy. Perhaps hearkening back to the 19th century mercant mercantilist uh, economic theories in which the, the economy is a tool of the state rather than, uh, uh, you know, being its own thing that just do, does its thing and the state has to step back. The economy becomes a tool of the state and the state is a tool of the nation. In that speech, again, nation, quote unquote, in that speech that I mentioned, um, he talks about that as well. Um, so, I'm going to conclude this because there are, many, there, are many, there are many aspects here and we don't have time to go over all of them. Uh, but, but notice the constitution. Read the constitution and notice some of those things that there. Some of the things that give you that give you a sense of the direction, the the nature of this new settlement, the new democratic settlement that Fides in, on which Fides tries to put uh, hunger. And let's notice also the problems implicit in such a settlement. Um, in, in some of these uh, uh, things, uh, the problems implicit in the fact that. Um, uh, you know, Fides has, um, uh, as their book makes it uh, uh, points out, has changed some of the laws regarding the functioning of the judiciary, the functioning of the media. It tries to make not only a state, a change in the structure and the function of, of the state um, and its direction, but also a change in political culture. And that's a dangerous thing, a sort of a cultural revolution of some sort, right? Um, you know, um, because um, it is a problem because if you try to control these things, right, one thing that you lose, especially if you have such an immense majority in the parliament, um, is you lose the democratic accountability. And it's this idea that, no, 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 we, we do it in the right direction, we do it in the right, with the right goals and so on. Um, well, the essence of the democratic system, of a democratic system, is to know that, that there are many parties which all think or say that they are doing it with the right goals in the right direction. The point is that none of them have the final answer, right? And this is why there is alternation in power. And this alternation in power that happens through elections, in which one government is changed and the other one comes to power, uh, is made possible by the fact that some of the institutions of the state, like the media, like the judiciary and so on, are independent, are non-political, okay? They are not set on one answer to the problems. Um, at least theoretically, right? Which means that the different government comes to power and then they do their thing, but they don't change the framework. They don't change the, the essence of the system, right? At least that's the, that's the theory. Now, if you try to change the, the framework itself, which is what this democratic settlement tries to change, try to change the nature of the Hungarian state, the, 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 the whole direction, right? The in, you know, the, the point, you know, uh, this has been said by, by Orban and Fidesz that, you know, they foresee a center-right government in power even 20 years from now, okay, or sort of a thing. Now that's a problem with that because you are saying, yeah, but it's, they have the right solution. But that's the essence of the democratic, of the of liberal democracy, the model that is the the model in place in Western in the Western world, is that we kind of assume that nobody has this sort of an answer, and it's unhealthy to suppose that someone has such a final answer. Right? It gets us close to ideology in the hard sense. Although it's not that the case here. Because having different governments change power, having different governments being elected and elected out, elected in, elected out, is the key tool to making sure that people who have power don't abuse it. And here's the, you know, the dark side of things. Because if the same party has control over most of the institutions of the state, and of, uh, uh, in, in the state, and, and influences them, what is the accountability? There's no longer accountability. There's no longer this, uh, uh, you know, the, this limitation imposed by 
uh, all, these, all those uh, frameworks by all those other political actors. And that leads to corruption. And that's one of the major problems or accusation brought to uh, some of the leading politicians, not to Orban actually, but some of the other leading politicians, the fact that you know when they control too much, they also benefit from that because that is human nature. That is human nature. Human nature is prone to abuse power, prone to reap its own benefits. And it is arguable that that might be the downfall of Fidesz. Uh, the downfall of Fidesz would be the public dissatisfaction with a certain perception of of abuse, of corruption. Uh, on the other hand, there's no alternative. Okay, I'm not saying again Fidesz is deeply corrupt or the Orban himself, you know, is corrupt or whatever. But it's the fact that they took control of, of more than what normally the parties that win an election would, would control, right? Uh, in this attempt of endeavoring a sort of a state political system and cultural change, right? Let's say with a good intention, say according to their, their narrative, right? The downside of it is that it's inherent that there will be many who will profit from this. It's inherent that there will be many who will profit from this. And that could be part of the downfall. On the other hand, the downfall to what? And here's the conundrum. Because the left doesn't exist, really. It's just bits and pieces bickering and no consistent. And plus, they have been tremendously delegitimized. Because remember, the economy now is working, and before in the center left governments, it was a disaster we like morning, noon, and evening. Okay? Who else? This short, small, green, urban, uh, secular, whatever party, they have no resonance in the larger Hungarian population. They're not going to be... Politics can be different, yes, for a very tiny niche. Who? The Yopik? I mean, that would be the cat a catastrophe. That would be a catastrophe, a, a quasi-fascist party, to, to, who got 20%, so they grew, right? So, a downfall of Fidesz would, in, with no doesn't have an alternative at this point. So it's a very, very interesting situation. The good news is that the economy is working, and that's the essence, right? That the economy is working, that people have recovered a sort of a hope, a good degree, but also some, there's also some cynicism discussed with all of these corrupt whatever, but there's also sort of a, at least you know that there is a direction, okay? Which during the social democratic, uh, free democratic uh, government, uh, there wasn't this feeling. And then when they discovered that you know, we have lied and whatever, it was complete falling apart of any hope that these people know what they're doing and that they should lead us and so on. So it's a very fascinating situation. Let's conclude with uh, dealing, uh, mentioning a few uh, key um, you know, issues in Hungarian politics. And in fact, uh, uh, I'll start with uh, some of... Um, Probably one of the most important ones and key ones, that, and also fascinating from a political science perspective, one uh, is the situation of the, and the case of the ethnic Hungarian minorities abroad. Right? Ethnic Hungarian minorities abroad, uh, which we explain why there are you know, 1.6 million in Romania, and, uh, hundreds of thousands um, uh, in Slovakia, Northern Serbia, Ukraine, and so on. So there's a large population of ethnic Hungarians who are, you know, have been part of the same state before 1918, right, but since, not since 1918, and the point is that you have clearly here a situation which the definition, self-definition of nationhood does not correspond with the definition of statehood. And also the case where, you know, the uh, alternative, well, let's construct the old, you know, Greater Hungary, which Jobbik would be for, clearly, right, an extreme right party, irredentist, Eurodentist means trying to change borders according to some historical uh, situations, right? That's Eurodenta, uh, Eurodentism. Uh, that's Jobbik. He, they would, right, be aggressive. Who knows? They would use the military or whatever. Um, uh, it's a very dangerous party. Uh, but uh, you have clearly a situation in which there is a clear national consciousness. Of course, how could it, could it be for the Hungarians of, who live in these other now other states, right, of being part of the same Hungarian nation, having a, a keen state right next to them, right, Hungary as a state, and the Hungarian state borders not corresponding with the quote unquote the borders of the Hungarian quote unquote nation, right. And when we talk about Romania, we'll talk about the, the, the ethnic Hungarians there and the situation where they're located, which makes it even more complicated. And as I said, uh, re doing the larger, the Great Hungary obviously is not a solution because we remember from the Austro-Hungarian Empire discussion that the Hungarian Kingdom was actually 45% was at other ethnic groups and nationalities, including the entire Slovak 
nation, right? So that's again. So, but you know, this is part of the conundrum of the modern nation state, right? Which is neither one nor the other, because you can't draw such pure boundaries unless you have, you know, war like in former Yugoslavia. Who wants that? Right? So you know, we're still stuck in this paradigm of the modern nation, modern state, and Fidesz is stuck in that, by the way. But anyway, what is the solution they gave, right? And we talked about this already, we talked about the four types of solution to the, the, the situation of that the model is the nation state, but the situation is that the nation does not correspond with the state. So you have states with ethnic minorities or multinational states and so on. So this, the solution is found, applied both during the first governance of Fidesz from 98 to 2002 and then reapplied even more forcefully after 2010 was this famous status law by which, and here's where political science really helps you to understand. If you understand and if you learned the definitions that we have discussed. We have defined the state as a set of institutions with sovereign power over what? And this is a, this is a constant mistake for I don't understand why. That people tend to always associate the state with a territory. A state is not a territory. It is a set of institutions that has control over a territory and separately, distinctly, also has a specific membership. This is why you, when you are, you are a member of which state? Of the United States. You are American means that you are a member of this state, meaning you have citizenship. You have citizenship whether you live in this state, the United States, or you go to Mexico, or you live in Canada, or you live in Zimbabwe, or you, and you travel the world for 54 years, you remain a member of the state. Your membership in the state is not linked to your presence in the territory. The set of institutions have power both over the territory, but separately over membership. And that's key to understand that the modern state has this dual that nature. It's a state, it's an institution, that has membership, and it's an institution that has separately control over a territory. And those are not the same. Because the solution found by Fidesz after the 2010 was to distinguish between these two. There is a Hungarian state, but then there's a Hungarian nation, which is not the same. And they use the fact that the modern state is these two things to grant citizenship to all ethnic Hungarians who, who want to get it from the neighboring countries. And suddenly you have a state of the Hungarian nation that is across several borders of territorial borders, and then you have the territory itself. So, and they don't tell them, okay, move here. No, because they separate these things. So now you have a state of a nation and a state of a, that controls a territory. And that's the Hungarian state, and this is the Hungarian nation, and both of them serve by the institutions of the Hungarian state to which Orban also makes reference in that speech. Uh, for, to show this, that this is actually very concrete, it's not just, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, foam on a whatever, you know, sort of a sprinkle of chocolate on, on something, it's actual and very effective. These people have the right to vote in Hungarian elections. People living for centuries, forever, in other in territories currently part of another state, can get Hungarian citizenship, remain there, they live there, that's, they're also citizens of that state, but they also have the right to vote in Hungarian elections, which normally usually happens, you know, for people who live on that territory. Now, it's not unique, this actually also happens, you know, Italy gives, uh, you know, if you're of Italian descent, you can get your citizenship you, here in America or Canada, wherever you are in South America, you will want, if you want, you get, can move to Italy, but you also have reserved spots in the parliament for in, people of Italian descent to live abroad, same for Poland, and so on. Many countries do this nowadays. It's a recent development, right? But usually countries do it by, okay, we give you some seats in the parliament for members of the diaspora, for members of the nation who live abroad and don't, never will come back and whatever, we give them rep representatives in the parliament, separate seats. That's not the case here. These people, members of the nation, they don't vote for separate seats, right? They vote in, in the sense of, you know, for representatives who represent the people from abroad. They vote in regular Hungarian elections. They vote in regular Hungarian elections, not for just, not for the leadership of the Hungarian state and not for three representatives for people from other continents, you know, as it happens in other countries, including Romania. 
right? So this is a very interesting thing. Uh, and clearly, it, it, is, it, is, it has been found as a solution to the situation of having large ethnic minorities. This has been, uh, you know, it's, a, it's one of the key uh, things in Hungarian politics since 1990. Different governments have dealt differently. The Social Democrats and the Alliance of Free Democrats have been more reluctant to actively support these ethnic minorities abroad, which have been a huge boon for the center-right or the right to say, well, you're traitors, you don't serve the nation, and so on. And why are you reluctant to help them, and so on. Right? Uh, it has also, it's a key issue in Hungarian foreign politics, uh, meaning that their interest is to have good relations or whatever and relations. Their relationship with the neighboring countries is shaped by the presence of large ethnic minority, part of the Hungarian nation, quote unquote, ethnically defined uh, members abroad. Uh, it has also shaped their, uh, their uh, membership in the EU and NATO of, of Hungary because actually Hungary, is, uh, Hungary has been a uh, state has been a, a powerful proponent of membership, EU membership for all its neighbors, including Romania. Why? Because being part of the EU means that borders disappear. They disappear not in the sense that the state is dissolved, but the thing, that, uh, the thing is that you can circulate freely and so on as part of being the part of the European Union, that set of institutions. You have, you know, this European citizenship means that you can settle anywhere, live anywhere, whatever. Uh, and that is, that is a huge uh, obviously, they want that, right? Because that's another way of bypassing the situation that the borders of the state do not correspond with the quote unquote borders of the nation. Again, in the interpretation of the nation that is ethnic based and so on, which I don't either endorse or whatever. Just to be clear. Um, okay, so all of these, uh, remember that, you know, ethnic areas are a key issue for Hungarian uh, foreign policy. Uh, just a few more issues, the situation of the Roma, of the gypsy population in, in Hungary, uh, the Roma is, uh, is a political correct name, uh, is uh, something um, that is not solved, uh, has not been resolved, uh, kind of similar to the situation with, that we discussed in the Czech Republic, uh, and the Jobbik is fiercely, you know, it's also uh, has, it promotes ethnic hatred in that sense. Um, there's also an East-West sort of a differentiation, if not clear between Hungarian society because the East is less developed than the West, that you see that that's a pattern in all these countries, uh, and, uh, and so on. But I think we discussed enough about the issues. In foreign affairs, member of NATO since 1999, member of EU since 2004, V4, very active, Visegrad 4. Um, uh, Visegrad 4 has become a very active, efficient tool, and now with this refugee crisis, if you follow the news, uh, the, the members of Visegrad 4 actually have developed a common stand which is actually against accepting uh, refugees and that includes Slovakia, Czech, Poland and Hungary. And Hungary has built a fence and, and it has received actual security military support from the other V4 countries to do that. There are talks about establishing a common di military division so it's a very interesting development. Um, okay. Um, there, there will be obviously there are also many other issues to discuss but I think this is enough for a survey of